Um, when President Mary Horgan asked me if I would contribute to this symposium today, I wondered why, as it has been a while since I've been actively engaged in screening. However, as an epidemiologist and biostatistician with a background in medicine, I have maintained a huge interest <clears throat> in screening ever since my time as the project coordinator of the ECHOES breast screening program. This was the first effort at an organized population-based screening program in this country and was the forerunner of breast check. And we gained hugely from being part of a network of European programs at that time. In my current role as a teacher of epidemiology, biostats, research methodology, to young healthcare professionals, I maintain a huge interest in the validity, reliability, accuracy, and all other aspects of scientific data, not just from a, a, an academic perspective, but of fundamental, it being of fundamental importance to decision-making in the public interest. By that I mean high quality, accurate, evidence-based, scientifically rigorous investigation considered uh, by clinicians and po pol politicians and policymakers to, uh, as the basis for decision-making in the public interest. This is no more evident than in the field of screening. Today, I will take an overview of screening and not necessarily concentrate on one form of screening. I've chosen to talk about important messages lost in translation. There are so many that it is impossible to do justice to all of them. Um, and so what important messages will I concentrate on? We do need to understand, not just as healthcare professionals, policymakers, and decision makers, that there are guiding principles for even getting started with screening. This information needs to be in the public domain. We do need to transmit the information about benefits and limitations of screening. And listening to Lorraine was very uh, illuminating uh, in her admission of not understanding these things at an earlier stage. I think the entire population are now getting to the point of having some understandings of limits and benefits. And we do need to think about managing public expectations through our promotion of the programs, but also our display in the media of the ways in which messages are transmitted. What do I mean by lost in translation? It's not malice and it's not deliberate. It is our methods of communication, who should be communicating, by whom should the communication be, by whom is it lost in translation, and to whom is it lost in translation. I will begin with selecting and looking at the principles of screening really very quickly. These originated in 1968 and have since, of course, been modified for context. And they include the fact that the condition of interest should be an important public health problem, that the natural history should be understood, there should be a recognizable, detectable early stage, that treatment at an early stage should be of more benefit than later, that there should be a suitable test or examination which is acceptable to the population. There are others which include that adequate facilities for diagnosis and treatment are available, that uh, screening should be repeated at appropriate intervals de depending on the natural history if we understand natural history of conditions, that the psychological and, and physical harm should be minimized and that the program is cost effective. In other words, that we have looked at these issues and looked at the opportunity costs associated with having uh, screening programs. Clearly, it would be impossible to take each of these principles and to go through them in terms of the message and whether or not they are adequately dealt with and lost in translation, but I will take two. The first is that the condition in question should be an important public health problem. What does that mean? We need to understand that this needs to be, or should be ideally, a condition that, has a, uh, that is of high incidence, high prevalence, has an associated significant morbidity, and ultimately mortality associated with the condition. Please don't get me wrong. This is not to say that every condition for which we screen is not important to the individual. However, we do need to look at this on a population basis. 
where does that information come from? We are fortunate in this country to have very good sources of routinely collected information on disease outcome and occurrence. And this gives an example of the type of fundamental data available from National Cancer Registry um, and from census data showing the numbers and the rates of cancers in two time periods um, actually, with an, you can detect there an impact of screening in terms of uh, the incidence. This is the type of information that's fundamental to decisions about screening. Not every condition for which screening is available can be regarded as a public health problem. As I said, yes, important for individuals. But in the context of limited resources and opportunity costs, it is the relative magnitude of the problem for the population as a, as a whole that decisions must be made as to the feasibility of screening. This message can get lost when it's not subjected to rigorous evaluation using available sources. Um, I think going forward, this is something that will need to be evaluated if, and there's always a, a, an advocate or a hue and cry for additional screening uh, modalities to be implemented. We need to be very critical and careful in our establishment of screening, as we know once they're established, dismantling them can be impossible. I want to concentrate on this fifth criterion there should be a suitable test or examination. What does this mean? The word suitable is not really giving us all of the context that we require here. What it really refers to is a test which has the highest possible accuracy to detect the condition that's being screened for. This is the most difficult criterion to fulfill and the one which is at the root of many of the difficult issues that we've been uh, hearing of and that arise in screening. Uh, Lorraine referred to this. She's not clear if failure of the test to detect a condition is an error or is actually part of the screening process. We must do better at getting this message out there. And that it's not necessarily always the case that it is 100%. In fact, it's really impossible for screening tests to be 100% accurate 100% of the time in every individual. There are so many factors that can contribute to that, not least of which, how do we determine how disease is determined? What is the gold standard? Sometimes gold standards themselves are not perfect. How do we decide on that borderline between positive and negative? Increasingly with quality assurance guidelines, with attention to detail in performance and interpretation of tests, this is getting better all the time. But we do know that as a consequence of uh, the uh, imperfection of both the gold standard and of uh, the screening tests, that there are unfortunate there are false positives and there are false negatives. The question about how this is reported, okay, sensitivity, that is the ability of the test to be positive in the presence of the disease. Is this possible all the time? Are there other factors, biological factors, individual variability of factors, factors, or, uh, factors relating to the performance of the test, factors relating to the interpretation of the test? Specificity, the ability of the test to be negative in the absence of disease all the time. I have one little plea here, and just to say that let us all vow to understand that this is accuracy, this is validity, this is not reliability. I'll come back to that later. The question really is, where is this criterion of positivity set, and how can it be modified, or can it be modified? There are conditions and situations where at one end of the spectrum, there's clear negativity, there's clear positivity. How big is that gray zone in the middle? What are the factors that can be, first of all, impl implemented to reduce that gray zone, but secondly, communicate that uh, particular issue to the participants in screening? That criterion of positivity influences both the sensitivity and the specificity in the following way. Decreasing it increases the sensitivity. Yes, that means that anyone likely to have the condition of interest will be picked up. At what expense? At the expense of false positives. Increasing the criterion of positivity will increase the, sen the specificity, in other words, reduce false positives, but it decreases the sensitivity. And so it is, in fact, a trade-off. 
the, the, the issue is having to weigh the cost of false positives in terms of increased anxiety at the time and the cost of treatment against the cost of false negatives. And it's that issue of false negatives that I want to spend just another couple of minutes doing and talking about. What do we mean when we say false negatives? Actually, we're talking about these cancers which we understand and call interval cancers. Question, how, are, how and when are they identified? The key issue here is it's not possible to identify those at the time of screening. That's not known. Screening is complete. Participants have left. Over the course of the subsequent period, within that interval between rounds of screening, whether it's an annual screening program, it's a two-yearly or three-yearly, within that interval, when cancers arise, they are known as interval cancers. Sometimes that may be because they arise symptomatically, as we know. Sometimes <clears throat> this may, they, they may occur in women, in this instance, who live in a different area. They've moved, they've moved away, or they live in a geographic area which is not right at the screening center. So screening center doesn't actually know about them. It takes time to complete the diagnostic and the therapeutic process. The information is captured by a population-based cancer registry, which of course has got to, uh, I, I have to uh, digress to say that no screening program can really be effectively in place without a national cancer registry. And we're very fortunate to have an excellent cancer registry here, which we can be very confident in, in terms of the quality of the information. The communication between the cancer registry and the screening program is critical. And once those uh, interval cancers have been identified, detected, reported back, only then can that sensitivity, that validity aspect of the screening test be assessed, be correctly assessed. What is the important message that's lost in translation here? Not all interval cancers are missed cancers. This is a really fundamental, important fact. Screening is not prevention. Screening, as we all know, is early detection. I could have a mammogram today, next week, quite uh, unpredictable and out of the blue. I have no idea, but I can begin to develop a breast cancer. Enough is known about the variability of the natural history of cancers to know that some may develop in a very short space of time, some may develop very rapidly. And when they come to attention, and the lookbacks and the reviews that we have heard about um, between, between screening rounds, it's really important, of course, that they take place. But it's also important to understand that not all of those interval cancers have been missed at the previous screening round. <clears throat> in fact, we've, we have looked at this uh, when we did have the ECHOS program in place and prior to the national program, we had adequate uh, time and follow-up uh, and access to National Cancer Registry data that we looked at the ascertainment and evaluation of interval cancers. Every program in the world has interval cancers. We're no different, no better, and no worse than others. They will arise. That's a message that really needs to get out there. I can't let the opportunity pass without acknowledging uh, my old colleague, Peter Skrubanek, and uh, his books on false promises and false premises and the follies and fallacies in medicine. He was uh, somewhat negative about screening, but he had some very cogent and important points to make. Um, and I think that we could all revisit some of his thoughts and benefit from those. So when we talk about messages lost in translation, I've put in here a list of people who perhaps are the people who lose those messages in translation, sometimes uh, because we simply don't know enough or we haven't understood enough. Healthcare professionals, we teach young people. We need to teach them about the principles of screening, about the issues with the diagnostic, the screening test, about the fact that it's not perfect. Um, advocates, policy makers, decision makers, you need to come on board with us here. We need to work together to understand the issues and the limitations. Politicians, likewise, and can I say also the media. But we're also the recipients of all of this information. Perhaps there are among us healthcare professionals who still need to understand more and more, and we all need to understand more about the limitations of screening. Um, 
people who are in the policy-making role or decision-making role need to understand more about limitations. We all have a duty to uh, inform the public about this. And one of the, the messages from the Scali report is that all screening programs are a balance of benefit and harm. So we're both, we're, we are, in this room here today, we are the people charged with the responsibility of delivering the messages. We're also the recipients of the message. I think perhaps what we do hope we will get out of today is that collaborative feeling and a, a moving forward. Lorraine mentioned this uh, to some extent, and this is not this particular paper, but the, the conclusion of it. This is a systematic review of patient expectations of the benefits and harms of treatment, screening, and tests. And I just direct you to the conclusion. This is a very extensive review, as you can see, 15,000 records, 36 articles. The majority of participants overestimated intervention benefit and underestimated harm. Clinicians should discuss accurate and balanced information about intervention benefits and harms with patients, providing the opportunity to develop realistic expectations and make informed decisions. So once again, I, I, I'm going to finish by just having a, a little chat with people from the media uh, in particular. And I do think that we see uh, reporting, and I don't wish to upset anybody or uh, insult anyone, um, but I do believe that we need to engage with you in understanding the messages, particularly understanding the data. As a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society in the UK, I have been impressed and delighted by the, the materials that they have uh, available. They started some years ago with training, training programs for BBC journalists and have extended it now to a much wider audience. They've even extended it to online training. And so it is possible, for example, to take courses online which uh, are designed specifically for journalists. And I do think that uh, we, <clears throat> we, the health professionals, need to engage with you on this. Um, I could give lots of examples, but here are what I call threshold concepts that are frequently misrepresented in the media. Communicating numbers with no denominators and no context and not telling us the fantastic things that we do so, so well, yet just concentrating on the one uh, person, patient, case that demonstrates a failure in some aspect. And I'm not denying failures, but I am saying, please give us the denominators. Understanding validity and reliability. These are two quotes which we do need to address. They're in some of our public information and they are not correct. Like all screening tests, bowel screening is not 100% reliable. I do believe the intention there is not 100% accurate. It could be 100% reliable, in other words, repeatable, reproducible, get the same result over and over and over again, every single time. That's reliability, that's not accuracy. Another one, no screening test is 100% effective. I, I, this is not necessarily a problem, but what does effective mean? Let's use the word that it is and that we mean, which is accurate. Um, so those are two what I would call threshold concepts that took me a long time to get my head around these and I work in this area and teach these concepts all the time. Reporting relative and absolute change. Let me give you off the top of my head an example of, let us say a change from, in something minuscule change from five to 6% is a 1% absolute risk, it's a 20% relative risk. Or a change from 5% to 8% is a 3% absolute change. It's a 60% relative change. So I rest my case. We are not really getting the information out there in the way in which it's best reported. And this applies too to reporting risk, uh, absolute risks, relative risks, inferring causation from correlation. There are some very interesting examples on that RSS website that you can look at. So can I just say that rather than using misunderstood statistics or poor evaluation or representation of data for dramatic effect, let's engage in a, in a, a concerted exercise and effort to report uh, data accurately. Um, on the 
subject of communication. This is a quote from George Bernard Shaw. The biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. We can all examine our consciences in that respect. And I hope in this, what's going to be a very weighty day, you will um, allow me to have, you, to have 30 seconds of uh, a little laugh, all right? Uh, I've got a 30 second clip here, which has important messages in it. When you get over the, the shock and perhaps the laugh that it will give you, Let's reflect on, and I'm finishing here, let's reflect on the two important messages that it is transmitting, that of trust and that of communication. Let's hope this works. How do I play that? Paul, and we're just, it'll be an exercise in building trust between one another. So Harrison, if you don't mind going first, uh, step up here on this chair and close your eyes. All right, and then everybody fill in, and we're going to ask you to fall, and then they will catch you. So you have to trust us. So I'm going to count to three. Just relax and fall, okay? One, two, three. No, wait, no, no, no. Thank you very much.